Africa Film for Impact Festival. Thank you very much for joining us, the meeting edition of Africa Film for Impact Festival, where we use film to drive positive change across um, the country and the continent. We're yeah. glad to have every one of us distinguished women. My boss is here, Dr. Amina Salihu. Ma, thank you very much for honoring this invitation. We're grateful. Um, we're very, very grateful. Thank you very much. And um, um, Inya will be handling most of the session with the panelists. So I'll be um, handing over to Inya after the keynote speech by Dr. Mm -hmm. Kole, I'm sorry. <laughs> By Dr. Amina Salihu, my bigger, my boy, oh at the top all comes to my mouth when I mention doctor. So, um, That's because Dr. I'm your um, sister, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Ma. So I'll be handing over to Dr. Amina Salihu to give us the keynote speech for this section before we go into the panel discussion. Dr. Amina, over to you. Thank you very much. Many thanks indeed, uh, my brother Bright. Thank you for inviting me to the Africa Film for Impact um, Festival. Um, afternoon, morning, depending on what part of the world you're joining from, dear colleague. Um, Bright had told me that I have 15 minutes to have this conversation with you. And I'm trying to um, ensure that I keep my word Please let me know if you can see a presentation on the screen. We can. Yeah, very, well, very well, very well. Excellent. Um, so what I want to share with you today on the theme that you see on the screen it, are things that I hold dear, uh, tested, and, and I believe in. And it's a lesson that I've begun to learn um, since I turned 40. Uh, never to tell people what they need to do, but to share with them what I know I have tried and I know is important. And so um, for me, the conversation really uh, is not around just what is the problem alone, but also focusing on what the solutions, possible solutions are and, and helping the distinguished colleagues um, in the creative industry to really think about the role that film and even theater can play in reimagining our reality because there's no doubt that our reality is problematic, but in that problematic also lies opportunity in terms of what we can do differently and maybe things that we might have thought of or we have never thought of before. Um, in thinking about empowerment, um, which I was asked to look at, I chose to look at power instead, first of all, because power is that ability to give grace to someone or to take grace away from someone. It's, it's, it's like it is, it's, it's powerful. And a way in which women experience power, which is a problematic, which I like to discuss with us this afternoon into the evening, is around gender-based violence. Um, and, and this could be physical, could be sexual, could be verbal, emotional, could be coercive, could be economic, educational, or just sheer deprivation. It can happen in our homes, it can happen in, in the public, it can happen in our places of work. And, and sometimes, sadly, it is normalized normalized in the sense that people think that is our way of working, that's our way of life. And then people don't even see it enough um, to actually even begin to challenge it. And today I want to be able to name some of those ways in which we are blinded to things that are so very visible and also helping us think through uh, what it looks like and what we need to address. And so the next slide, I have what is called the lay of the land. The next slide after this slide talks about the lie of the land. Um, this is a play on word. The lay of the land usually helps you understand uh, what is the situation like? What is the context in which we're operating? And, and what is it that is true? And what is it that is a lie? Like I said earlier, we need to pay attention to how discrimination, um, stigma and denial are, are becoming the norm. And there's a worrying expression that has seeped into our, our lexicon and that is sextortion. It is particularly something that's been reverberating in the creative and entertainment industry globally. And I'm sure you have followed some of the stories, both nationally and internationally, both proven and alleged. And, and Reuters uh, Foundation has actually told us that Nigeria is becoming the ninth most unsafe place to be a woman, just because of the dimension of power around 
sexual and gender-based violence, which takes away power really from women, from girls, and from boys, because boys also experience um, gender-based violence. And you know, the Mkwazi uh, Okonjo Iwala or Noi for short polls actually tells us, you know, very scary, if you will, about the number of people who have experienced rape uh, and the fact that it, it is much higher in, 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 in the Northwest and in the Northeastern part of Nigeria. And you can understand why. Conflict, insurgency fuels displacement, it fuels vulnerability, and this takes us into this kind of, of space. Um, hashtag me to hashtag times up. These are spaces that have challenged the industry of the colleagues that we have on the call today. So that's the lay of the land. Now, the reason why the lay of the land is not really gaining the traction it should gain is because there is the lie of the land. And the lie of the land is actually, as it says, not true. So there's a perception, for example, that the work of women doesn't count. Their work doesn't matter. Men are the breadwinners. But we know that women are winning and baking and feeding bread and much more. And sometimes we are told that silence means consent. No, it does not. It could be fair. We are told that women who dress in a certain way attract rape. But well, that is sexual corruption. There can be no excuse for it. It is sexual corruption full stop. They tell us it's okay for men to beat women. That also cannot be acceptable. There are different acts of subtle acts of exclusion or, or FAE. Um, and there are different ways in which we exclude women. Even in a boardroom, a woman comes with the brightest of scripting ideas. And because it's female, no one is listening. Then a man takes the same idea and raises it, and all of a sudden, everybody says, Oh, yeah, why don't you do that? Madam, what do you think about taking this forward? But Madam had been telling you this exact same thing, and you haven't paid attention because we have so perfected a subtle act of exclusion, even in a space where we should be prioritizing the power of knowledge and imagination. And so, distinguished colleagues on the call tonight, what exactly am I putting on the table for you? We need to walk the talk in the sense that we need to find new lenses through which we really see the power of possibility and how power can include and how power can exclude. And, and the entertainment industry is evolving and opening up room for women, but we need to ask how it is happening. What kind of roles are women getting? Are they getting the very stereotypical roles of the wicked stepmother and the wicked mother in law quote and unquote, or, or are we beginning to think about challenging the norm and, and creating new, new frontiers that help communities and society rethink those things they have taken for granted? And I asked the question in the fourth bullet, where's our Black Panther moment, for example? And, and, and how do we ensure that we have data? Do we have data in the industry about how many women are in the industry versus how many men? Do we have data about how many women are producers? and how many women are in the, in the engineering and technical sector, and how many women versus men have leading roles. We need to ask this question. What is the policy in our sector around the way we treat boys and the way we treat girls? Because when you work with children, there's a certain vulnerability around that, which we all have to be mindful of. And this particular um, um, slide on the screen always makes me laugh and make me cry at the same time. Um, we must respect the work that women do. We do not. And so you can see how the men are sweating because the woman who's been doing all this all the years of her life, putting the child on her back, the pot on her head, balancing it and carrying water for five miles, is saying, well, gentlemen, now let us show you exactly the power of what we do. And I feel very, very, very concerned for that baby who is straddled on that man's back. So the invisible work that women do is actually very powerful. And Oxfam has told us that the unpaid work, fetching water, cooking, ironing, being kind, being the, 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 the hospital and the judge and the accountant and everything in the home actually is worth $10 trillion every year, globally, $10 trillion. And because that work is not respected or recognized, we do not respect women. So a young girl is on the set and her job is to fetch your water and to fetch your fan and to run errands for you. And you don't recognize that that girl or that young boy doing that work actually makes you keep your makeup in place and makes you look like the superstar that you look like. We need to respect those people who work for us even when we don't pay them. Now, the issue that we focus on equally matter. How does it matter? If we're looking at themes that do not empower women, even though women are the ones subsidizing the state when those resources are scarce, then we have missed the mark. Again, 
here are women multitasking, baby on the back, you know, fetching water, talking about other things on the way to and fro. And then we have a development partner, a development uh, worker at the head of the table, a male. And we have six men surrounding him. And the head of the village is saying, women, we are too busy to this water. Let's carry on, that kind of thing. If women are too busy to discuss water, it is because they're busy subsidizing you and fetching the water for you. Who should be at this table? Let me leave that to the panel to discuss. Now, I'm going to leave in the next slide with some empowerment posers. And it's just about four questions. How can film retell and reenact history? If you note, I'm not asking for history. History is his story, is the story of men. That is already well told. Her story is her story. We need to bring our imagination to, to look at how women are excluded or included. How do we connect generations past, present, and emerging? There's so many things that happened before colonialism that gave power to women. And, and retelling that story is powerful. I was watching Bere and the theater the last time about the Eba Women's Revolt, and it was a very powerful retelling of the past, linking it to the present and challenging the, the emerging or the future leaders. How do we nurture confidence and grace and humanize? Because if we do not humanize everybody and consider every role as important, we cannot empower anybody. And I'm asking the last fundamental question there. Is there room for professionalism and affirmative action? The answer for me is yes. You don't have to choose one over the other because they are capable people in the sector. It's just that where you have a perception of sextortion or a perception of, of how do I put it now, nepotism, for example, or cronyism, then some of the good voices and, and imaginations will be left out. But these are questions that I want our panel uh, this evening to actually also um, spend a bit of time uh, looking at. Let me pause that video. That's something in Hausa, and that is a young girl called Hafsad who is learning mechanics. And that was on BBC. And most of the time we would never believe that a woman can do this kind of role. So we had lived in mechanic in the eighties or the nineties, but how are we using film to imagine our, 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 our imagination, to imagine what is possible and to get new half sets and new lady mechanics onto the firmament. And part of what I, I, I share with you in the next couple of slides, um, as I take my, my, I think I have about seven more minutes, is, is really to look at the whole dimension around how can we then do this? Because if, if, if I am telling you what needs to change, then how does it need to change? We need to be conscious about gender, geography, generation, and disability, and class. These are the diversities we need to be aware of. Language matters. He does not stand for she, and she does not stand for he. And we need to create safe spaces. How many of us have sexual harassment policies in our places of work? And I've asked a question about affirmative action. Are we able to allow a woman with a child have a safe space to work? Because if she does not raise that child, we will not have the next generation of, of workers in the creative industry. And how do we look at themes that can affirm and not disrespect? And how are we thinking about seeding leadership to women and young people and persons with disabilities? So that it's not just the same kind of um, leadership that we have had. I guess as I conclude, all I'm asking us to do is to rethink power, rethink access, opportunity, participation and control by asking ourselves the simple question, who has access to all of this? Who gets this and who is locked out? Who is inside and who is outside? And for able to look at that dispassionately, we will be able to address the question of, are we empowering or are we disempowering? And to look at the kind of norms that we have and some of the things that we are taking for granted. When we say Mr. and Mrs., Mrs. is not the equivalent of Mr. Because when Mr. was young, Mr. was master. And when, when Mrs. was young, she was Miss. So why do I have to be married for you to then tell me I'm an adult female? The equivalent of Mr. is Miss. What about women in 1929 was a revolt or a war. It was not a riot. Please stop calling it about women's riot. It was organized. Those sisters were serious strategists. Audit your team on your project, like I said, and ask yourself the question, where are the women? Audit the things you are focused on and look at how the subject matter might impact women. Are you going for money or are you going for glory? You've got to be able to ask yourself that question. And the two don't have to be separate. The two can actually go together. 
think about the respect framework, which you can see there. The respect framework is something that came from UN Women around addressing sexual and gender-based violence and more. And you can see what all of the SECT stand for. Um, and, and you know, um, it, it's not just the it's not just the popularity of Franklin's song, but respect continues to matter. And we continue to ask for respect. So that at the end of the day, distinguished colleagues, we're not only talking about equality, which sometimes can be where we start, but what really matters is equity, because to each according to her need or according to his need. So a woman who is pregnant might not have the same need as a person with disability, that is equity. But equity is not where we stop, it must lead us to justice. And that means removing the barriers. If we don't have enough women and men in the sector, why is that the case? And how do we get more of them um, into the sector? And to finally close by reminding us that we live in a world where life imitates art. So art is very powerful, art has power. Powers it is yet to imagine or to deploy effectively. And you are the art. The fixation with what already is by always sharing things that we know will always continue to prevent us from exploring the new. But even as we're exploring the new, I would like to ask us to also think about enhancing what is good in the old because we don't have to throw away everything. We should actually think about what is already good, what is already working, and we can add on that and build and build upon that. I thank you very much for um, your attention. Uh, as I, I rest my case, like lawyers would say, and I stop sharing my screen um, at this point. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Amina. We appreciate you greatly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Amazing speech there. I, I would need to um, I would need to watch this speech like five more times to be able to comprehend <laughs> the weight of this um, this presentation. Thank you very much. We appreciate it greatly. So we're going to go right into the panel discussion. Uh, I'll be handing over to um, um, yeah to take over from here. Yeah, please over okay. to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Amina. That was really powerful. And even though with the panelists, um, the plan um, is to talk about women empowerment and gender-based violence um, from the angle of storytelling and filmmaking. I think it's good to really go into what you said. African women in film and TV, if we want to develop, I feel like we need to ex extend the reach across Africa um, by promoting women's ability to tell compelling stories. Um, and I think that's the principal pri priority in that way. So I will open up to any of the panelists who want to speak on that in terms of solutions on how we can empower filmmakers or empower anyone who is working within the creative sector, not just film, whether theater or the rest of it, to sort of learn the basics of what, you know, telling, telling stories with women in, in the forefront, you know, is really all about. Is there anyone who wants to add to it? Yeah. So I'm happy to add a bit. Um, I mean, very powerful speech it was from uh, Dr. Amina. I'm very inspired by her. And it's important for me at this point to point out that, um, yeah, I'm a filmmaker as well, you know, and I understand the intricacies of storytelling. The big problem we have been having is the fact that the um, storytelling industry, the creative industry is largely funded by patriarchy. And so to that extent, it means that our stories have to be told the way patriarchy is comfortable hearing our stories. So if you are raped, you have to be ashamed of yourself. You have to, you have to play to the script of patriarchy. And these things do not reflect these. Um, our experiences may have, there may be similarities in our experiences, but each, uh, each reality is valid in its own self. And we need to have platforms that appreciate us and are willing to accommodate the diversity of our realities. And so um, making our issues, um, making our issues attractive enough to attract the funding, necessary fund or investment by way of funding. Um, I'm also thinking in the line of equipment as well, because sometimes all I need is just equipment, partnership with equipment, you know, not necessarily um, a huge budget like that, you know. So, um, and then of course, if it's issues for women, it's expected, okay, 
it just should be done there should be a moral instruction video like your crk classes or secondary school or something of the sort that's how you're expected to tell your stories right so we need to break the limitations that's currently um um that that currently are, are hooked up with uh, issues as women and amplify the voices of more women this would help to amplify the realities the diverse realities of all women because there's that thing about um when it comes to you know women we all try there's, there's uh, the tendency to try and force us all into one box so we all have to be the ideal woman before patriarchy we need to understand now that a lot of these things have translated into violation of human rights. A lot of these things have suppressed voices. A lot of these things have led to the deaths of other people. And pretty much once we're able to um, create space for more voices to be amplified, and, and, and it, it gives validity to the experiences of all the different categories of women. And that's the most important thing I find lacking. More and more, there are opportunities coming up. The challenges are still there, but there's still room for what to be done. Mm. In the last uh, two years, we've pitched over 60 projects, you know, to amplify voices of women. But the, 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 it's, it's all the same thing. Oh, it's too serious. Oh, it, it doesn't have the comic feature. Oh, it's this. For, do you tell us what genre that we should we should you know they're trying to force the messaging that we're trying to give out we need to have independent sources of expressing ourselves that's the most important thing yes i i totally agree and we had a seminar just on this recently where um, we tagged it um taking the power back and we spoke about taking power back from the um from from the funding aspect um, and because of that, a lot of funds were created for women just to tell stories um, that had strong leading female in certain ways. And um, yeah, I think it's improving. It's gradually improving. I don't know how much of the improvement we're really seeing within Africa or in Nigeria, but I know that um, in Europe and in the US, even though it's not enough, it's improving because now women are beginning to take leadership positions. They're calling the shots. Um, a woman is now the, the head of or one of the major heads of um, Netflix in that way. So if you bring a story that has um, strong female lead, you will get funding. And then the same thing with AC. Um, recently, I was mentored by the former, um, she's a former VP for HBO, but now the mayor of New Jersey. And um, she is totally responsible for Game of Thrones that we know and many other projects as well. And that led her into politics. So I totally agree with what you're saying. I believe that by taking power, we need to be in positions where we can, we need to be in the forefront of things and need to be in a position where decision making is possible and we are the ones handling funding um, for projects. Anybody else wants to add anything to it before we continue? Okay. Uh, oh, anyone? Someone unmuted himself. Okay, so I'll, I'll just Dor continue. Dorothy again. Uh, it was Dorothy. Um, yeah, let me know when you want me to come back in because listening to, uh, you know, both of you's intervention is really quite powerful for me. Mm. And I think the question that I, I explore um, in the keynote is the how. How mm. do we, because we know what we need to do. And, and, and it's, it's how we get it into the mainstream. So if we have a space where women are organizing and they're making their kind of film, until we come to the mainstream, the challenge that Dorothy talked about would always be there. Um, because as long as the rules of the game are not the rules that we have co-curated, they're not going to suit us. So in the leadership of the mainstream, there's got to be women in the leadership of the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Organizing. Yes. The, the rules of the mainstream should also recognize affirmative action. And like I said, uh, affirmative action does not preclude merit. And so many, I mean, look, look at the voices on the call tonight. But because our lens is very, you know, befuddled, we can't really see clearly what we're looking for. So we've got to help them to, to see that very, very well. And then we ourselves as women must lead by example. Because mm. if I 
uh, and, and I have done this before and I've seen a, a male colleague do this, you know, I've seen, uh, and he's innocent, innocent Chikuma is the country director for Ford Commission. He's male, like, like you've heard from his name. But if I came on a panel and it's a panel of say four or five, and there's no female on it, or there's only one female on it, and I'm that one female, I will not participate. I will come on and I'll make the political statement about why I'm going to participate. Now, if I read a script and I see the tilt of it, and it's not telling me the kind of story that I think is compelling enough for women, I should be able to say, you know what, I have a problem with this. And that's why I was asking the question, is it about the money or the glory? And the two can go together. But if, if we are organized and we're protecting people who are doing things that look like it's outside the mainstream and bringing it into the mainstream, and we have men like Bright on this call who understand that it is not smart economics to leave out 50% of your population. We've got to work together. And like you said, Inya, the international community is so open to this. And as you influence the, the direction of the money and they put in certain indicators that that help people know that if you're not thinking in this way, you're not going to get the support you need. That will probably make the change that we need to see um, begin to happen, so to say. And data, the role yes. of data is you must use data to tell the story. So that if they're telling, oh, but you guys are then, how many are we? These are the girls, these are the boys. So you tell me, what's the data telling you? That is very powerful to evidence and work it. Yes, I totally agree, um, Dr. Amina. And to, to the how, it is through programs like this, having this discussion, but not just leaving it here, but taking steps in that way. I have three programs that are for women filmmakers who, you know, the idea of those projects are to um, um, empower women and put them in, in leadership positions. Because if you look at the international um, world and people who have been able to do it, it's by starting from programs like this and then moving it on to the next step. And then when they see that your, power, your voice is very powerful, they would even invite you to the table. They would invite you to the table. And then when you get to the table, you're able to make changes that are needed. Um, uh, so the, to the past, um, thank you so much. And sorry for the issues um, we had uh, logging in. Um, I would open the floor up to everyone to introduce themselves. I just want to mention everyone's name on the panel. We have uh, Mrs. Mayowa Bisola Adegule of Ashake Foundation. And then we have Mrs. Dorothy Njemanze of Dorothy Njemanze Foundation. We have Mrs. Chiki Ogbonaya of Warif. And then we have Mrs. Patience Sonise David of Legal, Rema Legal Consult in Abuja. And we have Mrs. Chioma Onye, Onye Nuchea Uko. I'm so sorry. I'll, I'll say that again. Mrs. Chioma Onye Nuchea Uko, who is the vice chair, NBA Abuja branch, um, Unity Bar. So please, let's start from Mrs. Chioma. Please introduce yourself. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be on this conversation. And um, permit, permit me to start off from the, from the prefix to my name. You know, um, when our um, dear big sister, Dr. Sally, who spoke, mm -hmm. she made mention of, um, yes, she, she drew attention to how we define some of these things that, that, that phrase the perception of women or maybe how we want to feel important or feel, I mean, like we had attained something. And I don't think that um, some of these prefaces are necessary, especially as it uh, affects um, marital status. I don't see how that should define who I am on this panel. I do not remember that I submitted my name as a missus, where though I am, but it's not something I like to, I, I don't think that's what we should be talking about. So forgive me if I'm coming off rather, um, maybe from a, Hash footing. I'm sorry. I don't like to. I don't like to be so addressed. I don't like it to be on the table when we are having conversations that are um, important to us. So, um, by way of introduction, of course, my name is Choma Onyenuchiya Uko, as has already been said, and I'm um, I'm happy to be here. I I don't know if you need me to go ahead with anything else immediately. Um, no, it's fine. And I apologize. It is um, preference for some people to be addressed that way. So maybe what we should have done is to ask you um, if, yes, if you would like to be addressed that way. So please 
if there's anyone who doesn't want a missus um, in front of their names, if they're being addressed, okay, so everyone will call you by first name, yeah? Thank okay, you. so different, different folks, different strokes. <laughs> I've had first names where people would say, no, please address me as missus. And then I would have some people say, absolutely not. So thank you so much for pointing it out. And that's absolutely fine. Um, so yes, please let's go to um, Chichi Ogwenaya of Warif. Please introduce yourself. Good evening, Dr. Amina. Thank you so much for that opening address. And um, nice to meet you again, um, Madam Ndimaze. I know she was um, on the last platform, the last um, program you had. Um, thank you so much. And um, Inya, right? Yes. Thank yes. you so much. Well done. I, I just joined. <laughs> um, I've been online though, but I wasn't um, following the conversation. I, I'm here. My name is Chicho Bunaya again. I'm presenting Women at Risk International Foundation, WARIF. I work here as the project manager under the community service pillar. Um, yes, so I guess when we get into the discussion, I would um, say more. Thank you. All right, great. Um, thank you so much. Um, let's get to Dorothy Njemanze. Please introduce yourself. Okay, I'm Dorothy Njemanze. I always start by introducing myself as a human being. And so um, <laughs> the titles that make gender something very serious are things that I don't fancy. And I always tell people, if you want to give me a title, I'm an ambassador. I'm, you know, I'm royalty, so Her Royal Majesty will do just fine. Oh, Her Royal Majesty. <laughs> yeah. So, nice. But, um, above all, I, I'm a filmmaker, and I'm also a development worker. I work with the Dorothy Jamanza Foundation, and we respond to victims of sexual and gender-based violence. And it would interest you the number of people who are victims of sexual and gender-based violence that are itching to tell their stories in diverse ways and express themselves in diverse ways, diverse artistic ways, through song, through paintings, through drama, through different You know, um, recently we had a lot to do with children that are pregnant. And I've learned a lot from how they communicate amongst themselves and share their experiences amongst themselves. And it, it's something that is really instructive, you know, that people should carry on and people should amplify. And so helping victims of sexual and gender-based violence better understand legal provisions and mm -hmm. procedures using arts is my forte. Um, I'm alive today because, because of the arts. Um, and I'm happy to do what I do. I would not be doing anything else, you know. I'm a human being, I use the arts. And the, the biggest challenge has been trying to, trying to take away from what I'm worth because of experiences that I have gone through, including, you know, being raped way over 20 times amongst other things. And seeing people like me strive on is something that continually encourages many other people to express themselves, to find their voices. And that's why I'll never miss an opportunity to share my experiences and encourage people to invest in people like us because the world of experience is a lot. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So I will go to Patience Onize David. Please introduce yourself. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I should also start by saying I feel very honored to be in the midst of such smart and brilliant women. I've gone through the bio. It's an honor to be here. So um, my name is Patience Onize David. And um, I'm an author, let me say I'm an author, a lawyer, and a mediator. I think if I'm going to say something unique about myself is that I'm so passionate about peace that I, I became too passionate and my boss decided to in the mediation department. So that's how I found myself here and I don't regret it. I'm so happy to be here So and to learn from everyone. Thank you so much. Um, and um, for the, the last but not the least, uh, we have uh, Mayowa Abisola Adegile. 
I'm executive director for Asha Care Foundation. So what we do is we do empowerment, education, employment, and sustainability for widows and their children in Abuja, Nigeria. So I'm excited to be here. Um, I work with a That's very great. wonderful set of women who go through all forms of violence. And so I'm here to learn. I'm here to grow. It's good to see Dorothy here. I've heard her <laughs> speak several years. Nice. I've been blown Thank away. You. For people like her that can come out and share their experiences, it's good, you know. Some people, some yes. people don't have the the strength or the courage yeah so yeah. thank you to everybody and then i'm happy to be here so let's meet let's yeah. grow network and have fun thank you. yes thank you thank you everyone for the introduction um so we'll be discussing um and telling we'll, we'll focus on telling gender-based stories from an empowerment point of view and um and to also talk about your efforts um in curbing violence against women um the first question, I think I'll put two questions together because we've been here for a while. Um, what is your definition of women empowerment? And uh, from your own point of view, and also um, what is your definition of gender-based violence? As you see, we all have you know, different ways of um, defining things. And I think that's, let, let's start from there. Your definition of women empowerment, your definition of gender-based violence, and then we'll go along from there. So Patience Onisa David, please. Okay. Yes. All right. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. I'm unmuted. Right. So um, I would want to define this from the point of view of a lawyer. Right. And from the, let me say, a little point of view from a mediator based on the kind of experiences I've had with um, clients that have to do with clients that um, were, were survivors of um, domestic violence or rape. I believe that women empowerment um, is actually when a situation where the le a legislature that you have in relation to Nigeria now, the legislation that you have commits to making effective laws that cover the interest of women and ensures the protection of women. Also, I believe women empowerment is where the justice system is women friendly and where um, enforcement of those laws cuts across all jurisdictions. The reason why I'm saying this is because the the laws, the like, for instance, for instance, the VAP Act that we celebrate so much is so limited in jurisdiction. So I feel that women empowerment will happen because women will be able to express their interest. And like the doctor said, she mentioned about nurturing confidence. You'll be confident. You, I mean, that's the process of empowerment. You feel confident when you know you have the justice system that protects you. So I, I feel that from a lawyer's point of view, all the justice system that you can, you can utilize to help these survivors of violence and victims, I feel that it is totally useless. So once you have all, the, all this together, you, you can work on, you can say, yes, the women will feel empowered. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I totally agree with you. And it's good that we heard from the legal point of view. Um, what about you, Dorothy? What do you think? What is your definition of women empowerment and um, also gender-based violence? What, what's uh, based on your experience from your own point of view? Well, from my point of view, gender-based violence has been, of course, violence done to any human being. Um, on grounds of the gender. And being in a patriarchal society, the tendency for um, violence to be done against a particular gender, the feminine gender, you know, is high. While we're talking about the masculine and the feminine gender, I am also sensitive to those in between because mm. I'm aware of intersex, in fact, we have not done justice as filmmakers by not telling the stories of those in between. 
And so um, I, I think that's part of why I'm very um, sensitive when people try to accord me a title to, you know, depicting my gender. I, I am very in tune with the struggles of the intersex and, you know, I, I am, uh, well, yes. Yeah. So what would, what would, what empowerment? Empowerment is the ability to be. Empowerment is the ability to be simply because we are human. Empowerment is the ability to enjoy expressing oneself or enjoy human rights simply because we are human. No ifs, no buts, no whys. The empowerment would be um, exposure or ability to have equal opportunities and um, uh, yeah, equal opportunities just like every human being should have. That empowerment. The moment any um, you're denied what should be yours, you're disempowered. And in so many ways, people have used all sorts of fallacies to deny women of what should be theirs. They have given excuses for mutilating uh, clitorises amongst other parts of our bodies, you know because of what their pleasure, for their viewing pleasure, for their listening mm -hmm. pleasure, whatever pleasure, without taking into cognizance the emotions of us as human beings, without needing to um, bat an eyelid about how another person feels, simply because there definitely is diversity. The empowerment to be the ability for me to be me and you to be you and us to be women without needing to, you know, look like the same person or being forced to be the same person because men don't force themselves to look like other men. Mm -hmm. So why, do they, why right. must you be the perfect woman? You must be the virtuous woman. Oh, an innocent girl was raped. What if I was a guilty girl? Should I be raped? You know, all those kind of things. So um, empowerment is the ability to break all the barriers that have been used to put us in shackles over time. Empowerment is the ability to see our stories as worthy of being told, simply because they are our stories. And if they are our stories, it means that there are people who can relate to the stories. They don't have to be, you know, our stories may not be for the patriarchy community, but how about thinking about investing in stories that would, you know, for, for the rest of us that are not thinking along those lines. So that's empowerment to me. Thank you so much. Very insightful. And part of what you said about intersex, uh, intersex is, is why we needed to ask this question. So we can all share our thoughts about, you know, our own point of view in terms of what empowerment means and what gender-based violence, because then, and people will say gender-based violence is, you know, about women. Some will say, well, oh, no. it's not. Yeah, exactly. No, no. I've heard what that before. Today about, so, I was complaining today about the fact that a lot of young boys are being sodomized. And I mm -hmm. said, covered by the VAP Act. And when people thought that, you know, I was talking too much, I said, go look at the definition. They say, oh, but the penal code and the other, um, the criminal code. And I said, look, the more... The most recent law is the one, you know, that outshines all the other ones. And so we need to tell people these stories more and more. If I ask Absolutely. now, how, if a vampire came your way, what do you do to save yourself? I'm sure everybody would know what they would want to do. Those who want to have a stick or a cross or something or onions or garlic or whatever. But do vampires really exist? So mm. through the of our imaginations, we have developed that. I think we can also use pigments of people's imaginations using arts to bridge the knowledge gap that exists and better mm. human rights, you know, just for our shared humanity. Yes, thank you so much. So I'll go to Choma. Um, what is the definition of um, women empowerment for you and gender-based violence? Okay, and um, thank you, Inya. Um, I will um, start from where Dorothy um, brilliantly ended on um, gender-based violence. And that is to corroborate our position that, of course, when we talk gender, we are not talking just the feminine gender. We're not specific to any of the genders. And 
gender-based violence is essentially looking at those forms of violence that target uh, 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 different genders in the manner of their expressions. He, she has given the example of sodomy. And all of them are not necessarily physical. Some of them are born from some kind of um, prototype, some kind of um, prejudices that has, that has been formed over the years by a, a, a given um, orientation of how women should behave or maybe how men should behave and the rest of it. You, 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 see, you, see the, you see the boy, the, the, the boy child goes through a lot of um, psychological and emotional abuse, mostly because he's expected to be strong, he's expected to macho things and you know, not, not, not express emotions, not just to be human and express himself the way he feels per time. Those are, those are violence and they're gender-based. In, in same manner, a, a, a woman is not expected to, to you know, maybe have certain desires or, or make um, um, uh, um, certain um, aspirations. When, 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 we, when, we should, when we allow for people to be shut down from making those, as, I mean, aspirations, when we allow for people to, to be cast in those modes and not allowed to express themselves as they would, it, it, it's abuse, it's violence, and they're mostly on gender lines. So that is what gender-based violence is. Any form of violence that is meted out against any human on the basis of his or her gender is simply gender-based violence. Now talking empowerment. For me, woman I mean, women empowerment is anything that helps boost and improve or protect and promote a woman's um, um, sense of self. Anything that helps a woman to be able to, to um, aspire to whatever status, to maintain whatever status, to, to um, enjoy um, God-given rights, to, to, just, to, to just be who she wants to be, to the extent to which she wants to be it, without any bounds, without any restrictions, without any discriminations, without any, any, any definitions that are imposed I mean, and intended to diminish her or, or subjugate her, or hold her down. So anything that breaks those barriers, anything that helps protect her from those impediments and those um, colorations that are intended to stifle, that is empowerment. So when we help a woman to, to, to express her voice, to own her voice, to enjoy the efficacy and the strength of the voice she has and the powers that are innate in her, we have empowered that woman. That is what empowerment is about. I used to, I mean, before, think empowerment was mostly around education. But I realized that there are 1,001 well-educated women who you would, you, would, you would be shocked in the manner of their thoughts, in the, in the very primitive and, and retrogressive manner of thinking that they have inculcated over the years. And I realized that it goes way beyond that. Except you're able to perceive, um, education from the point of orientation, from the point of e e e even, uh, um, I mean, mindset development, learning and relearning and even, well, learning and unlearning, and of course, relearning a few things. Until we look at education from that point, we may not, education alone will not be sufficient empowerment. But if we look at education from that point, we'll now see that with that, a woman can be anything. And the rest of those other forms of empowerment be they financial and the rest, are more, I mean, a woman is more able to um, um, aspire to them and acquire all of those. So that's my perspective on empowerment. Thank you. And, and gender-based violence. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll go to Mayowa. Um, what's your definition from your point of view? Okay. Um, my own, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my own definition on um, women empowerment is giving women more access to make life decisions. So when you give a woman more access, you know, when she has, when she doesn't have to struggle to get access into places, because I always feel that for empowerment, for a woman, for you, for you to say a woman is empowered, she has got to have good inclusive leadership positions. She has got to be given the privilege to live a full and complete life. She'll be able to make her choices, her status, her decisions by herself without being stereotyped or forced to make things she doesn't want to make. So 
when a woman is empowered, like I always tell people, an empowered woman is a powerful woman. A woman who has been empowered has the opportunity. Everybody would enjoy the privileges of an empowered woman. When we're growing up, when we, we had mothers who did things for us, some of us maybe didn't have mothers who were given the opportunity to speak when they wanted to speak because of culture and tradition. And so when we grew up and they saw and wanted to, and someone to enter into marriage of such, it would is it affected. So when you see a woman who is who has who has her place, her class, her structure, she has the opportunity to speak, speak well, speak right, educated, nurtured get access to things that she ought to get to it, it even always comes back to show you even, even her children everybody around her gets better when a woman is better a woman mm -hmm. for me a woman is a seed and when, whatever you sow into the ground is what you get if you sow a, if you sow a seed of of a weakling of someone who is shut down every time who cannot fend for herself fend for herself first of all who is not happy who is who has always been told to please shut to shut up and i saw people that mm -hmm. when you tell someone to always shut up shut up people don't understand the value of shut up so when when you see a woman who is empowered it shows in her countenance it shows in the way she relates with other women it shows it shows in the things that she strives for because i look at okonjo Uwela and i'm wondering where did that woman come from? She's a woman, she's a definition of an empowered woman. An empowered woman will strive for a position without, she won't look back. She doesn't think whether she, she's a woman or a man. To her, she's a human being. And so she can go for anything. That's an empowered woman. And so hmm. it, it even shows um, amongst your environment. And so when I talk about gender-based violence, I like the fact that people were not totally um focused on the female mm -hmm. i was looking i was I, I i saw the videos that they sent to me to the ffif videos and i saw dark one of the entries that came in dark and it blew my mind you, you will not believe that it was the wife of our brother that was raping her raping him sorry people don't understand that gender-based violence is not only streamlined to women it's male and female I was having a conversation with someone today and I was saying, when you see a man who has been violated, who has been told that you must not cry. When you cry, you're a weakling. I tell people around me, if you're a man, if you're sad, if you want to cry, cry. Hmm. If you're happy, be happy. Don't allow any stereotypes to hold you down. And I work with widows. So those, those set of women, I have a lot of stories about widows who have experienced every form of violence, psychological, financial. You take you take all the properties away from her. She does not, she has, she has to, to, to sleep near a dead person, drink the water. See, it's not, it's not, they're not stories. I have seen women who have gone through these things. It affects their psychology. I've had women who five years ago, when their husbands were still alive, they were looking so fresh and alive. Mm. But the trauma involved when their husbands died and then the the violence that was meted out on them the the fact that everything was taken away from them you you you, you accused the woman wrongly you you have to marry your uh, your husband's brother so all those things are are the things called gender-based violence mm -hmm. when you take the right of somebody away from the person you don't have the right to do it you take someone's rights away you take someone's freedom away you take someone's take someone's um, not only life, you take someone's joy, you take away someone's hope. But when you rape a girl, you've taken away her confidence. It just takes her to do a lot of self-motivation. When we, when we see women who come out and say, oh, I've been raped, people don't understand that. It took a lot from her for her to come out. It took a lot. When you see women who when you see women who have gone through financial violence, who have gone through marital violence, who have gone through, who experience, I can't imagine a woman being beaten in her husband's house. I cannot fathom it. The psychology involved, the emotion, people don't, when people say the battlefield is in the mind, it's really in the mind. When you kill someone's mind, you've taken away the, 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 the hope of a human being. 
you violated the person. And so for me, that's that for me is gender-based violence. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we have 15 minutes more. I'll go to Chichi to tell us her definition. And then I'll ask everyone what the key process of a filmmaker would, uh, or what the, the key processes would be that a filmmaker needs to follow um, when they're telling um, empowerment stories or they're telling stories on, on gender-based violence. So let's go to Chichi first. Thank you. Good evening once again, everyone. And um, thank you to all the amazing women here. You've said so much. <laughs> and um, I'd like to say, I'm um, taking a cue from what um, has been said already. Um, empowerment, for me, I would say, is uh, giving the woman the ability to be and to do. Um, one of the panelists mentioned something whilst we, when we started. She talked about the fact that, you know, people want to attach maybe the miss or something to a woman. They, they feel all you're about is being a wife and maybe a mother. And for some reason, if you're not yet a wife and you're maybe a, a mature adult, maybe um, you're in your late 30s, late 40s, or mid 50s sometimes, um, the society tend to feel that um, something is wrong. You have failed in one particular aspect of your life. And in this space where I work in, I mean, every day we see a young girl walk through our doors, our parents reporting a case of her being raped, being um, sexually defiled by a neighbor, a father, um, a church member or something. And in, in most cases, when we're trying to um, tell the woman the need to pursue the case further beyond the medical services that we provide to them, beyond the psychosocial counseling, when we say you need to take it up legally, let's make sure that the perpetrator is brought to the book. You hear things like, because they are mostly um, from the rural communities and sometimes we have Yoruba speaking people and we have even the Igbos, you know, but mostly you hear things like in Yoruba, ah, eh, ah, le sorosita, onirioko fe, meaning you can't speak up, she won't get married. What would people say if they found out that she's been raped? And in my head, I'm wondering, what if she commits suicide? We should be old enough to even get married. So I, I believe empowering the woman is letting her understand that her life is um, not just subjected to her being someone's wife or somebody's mother. If she decides not to be married, it's also a valid choice. If she decides not to be a mother, it's also a valid choice. She can go out to build an excellent career, do well in a field, and still lead a successful life without necessarily um, having to be someone's wife. And if for some reason she's not that yet, the society shouldn't stigmatize her to make her feel, oh, there's something wrong with her. She, she, she has failed in one way. You know, and it's, it's the reason we have a lot of survivors of rape and sexual violence who don't come out to speak up because we, we don't have an enabling environment, an environment that would embrace the survivor and let her know that it's not your fault. We have a community of both women and men who are here to support you. It is not your fault that that has happened to you and it's not the end of your life. You can still go ahead to live a successful life beyond that. And like one of the pa panelists mentioned, it, it goes beyond um, getting education because we have a lot of people who advocate for girl-child education. That is the way you can empower a child, empower a girl-child, empower the community. I'm like, there are a lot of educated people who have gone through the four walls of university and their mindset is what? You hear them say things, these are the people who would go on social media and say, why did you wear a short skirt? It's the reason you got mm. raped. Why, why you went to your boyfriend's house? What were you expecting? Or oh, you've had sex with him before, so why are you saying no this time? You know, you, you, you have women making comments saying, he's your husband, so if, he, if, if you're angry at him, you shouldn't deny him sex. So if he hits you and decides to rape you in the process, you cost it. You know, so we have a lot of educated people who still need a reorientation of the mind. You know, so for me, if we are talking about empowering women, I would say that it, it, it's giving her the ability to be who she wants to be and to do whatsoever she wants to do without being judged or being stereotyped like one of the panelists mentioned. And for gender-based violence, we've mentioned it. When we say rape, we're talking gender-based violence. And like we also mentioned on this platform, um, according to the United Nations statistics, one in, in four girls before she reaches the age of 18 would have encountered one incidence of um, sexual violence, be it actual rape or se sexual assault. And that same statistic says one in six boys. Um, yes, so the same yes, statistic okay. says one in six boys. So it doesn't mean that boys are not being abused. One of the panelists mentioned that at a very young age, that little boy is crying and the mother is saying, don't cry, Boy, boys don't cry. You have to be a man, Sharabi or Korean, and all of that. You know, so we have men who are being beaten by, by their wives, but again, we live in an environment where people are not enabled to speak their truth. When they come out to 
say, this is happening to me, we shame and we blame them. So a lot of people would rather suffer in silence and um, keep quiet. So when we say female genital mutilation, we're talking about gender-based violence. When we say um, human trafficking, child trafficking, we're talking about gender-based violence. So whatever thing that is, uh, that is demeaning to that on other individual, whether male or female, anything that makes that other individual feel less of who God has created them to be, it's um, a form of gender-based violence. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. I wish we had enough time. Um, they flagged me that we have um, about 10 minutes. Um, so I'll just go to the last question quickly. I had more questions for you. We wanted to hear more from you, but um, we should do this again soon. Um, the last question would be um, to filmmakers or for filmmakers. What is the key process a filmmaker would need to follow to successfully tell an impact story? And please let it be based on your experience as well. So I'll start from Chi Chi. Okay, um, thank you. I'm not a filmmaker, and I'm I'm not sure. I don't know what the I don't know what the future. So from from yet. the Warif angle, from the people yeah. you counsel, what do you, yeah. what do you think people need to have in mind when a filmmaker says, "Oh, I want to tell the story of a survivor," um, for example? What do you think they need to know? Okay, thank you. I think um, they need they need to know that um, the, the the issue of rape and sexual violence, first off, is not it, it's never the fault of the survivor. Always the fault of the perpetrator, regardless of how it happened, where she was, what she wore, the relationship she has or had with the perpetrator. Rape is always and always the fault of the um, perpetrator and never the fault of the survivor. I'd also say for filmmakers, I mean, we, we have very few people that are telling the stories using um, the film. And we have more mm -hmm. people who um, sexualize women. You watch the musical videos that we have out there and you know, you, it's all about the woman being naked, a guy sees her and the next thing he wants to take her home and sleep with her and all of that. And a young person watches that video and feels that's the norm, that's the standard. And if a girl says no, then he applies force. So I'd say filmmakers who want to tell the story that, about rape, about gender-based violence, they need to um, see it from the survivor's angle. I'm not um, saying I want to do a, a movie or I, want, I just want to tell a general story because in mm. seeing it from the survivor's angle, then I, I believe the storyline will be tailored well enough that even the people watching can get to understand and feel the survivor's pain. And ultimately, I think we'll have less of the shaming and blaming of survivors in our society. You know, if we can have people who can be deliberate in telling the story from the survivor's angle, regardless of... Uh, how the, the whole incident of rape or sexual violence or gender-based violence occurred. The number one thing I think that has been missing has been the fact that a lot of our stories have been voided because uh, what makes us original has been, um, a lot of people have been made to feel that if you don't fit into certain boxes that have been created by patriarchal structures, then you're not original enough to be heard. And mm. so if we remember first that there are human stories and we look at things as human stories, then we'll see that there's a large diversity of topics and things that people can treat. Um, another thing is that um, the stigma that is placed on people who are survivors of sexual and gender-based violence, honestly, the depth we have is something. So I remember mm. that last year we started this... Um, 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 it's a movement of females in film, not in film, of female creatives rather, you know, and the whole idea was to amplify our stories by ourselves and give validity to our stories by ourselves. It is such a huge, huge, huge thing. And what happens now is that it's only stories that patriarchal um, investors think are worthy to be invested in that make it to the market. So we really need more and more um, I, I, I can't hammer on it enough. At the moment, mm. we have over 60 things that are productions that can amplify our stories. And when I say amplify our stories, there are different angles to it. So there are things like um, um, what's the, the provisions of the law. I, I, I strongly see um, the arts being used to bridge the knowledge gap that exists in so many places, in so many ways. I see opportunities for us to tell stories in our languages. You know, I see all of that, but I think when it comes to women, we are more critical of 
is, is your story your story has too much pain can your can the amount of pain in your story really be seen as art i tend towards provocative art a lot and i have no apologies for it that's my start. um pretty much validating the voices the female voices that exist it has been the missing gap and in validating the female voices that exist that's where the um opportunities for pay within the industries come in the opportunities to feature people now we're seeing that there are more female directors that are emerging by the day there are more female producers that are emerging by the day there are more female videographers you know uh directors of uh, photography uh, of photography and all of that we're seeing more of these people and that tells you uh, there are more female electricians on set you know mm. and the rest of them and that tells you that there's no limitation to where we can be the problem before now had been seeing everybody as a human being or as human enough to do what they want to do. Now, when we admit that everybody is human enough to do what they want to do, the next thing is, are resources um, going to be diversified enough to uh, tell our stories? Because so many people will tell you, oh, um, yeah, we don't have a budget to use film for so, 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 and so. But you have a budget for education. You have a budget for uh, awareness. You have a budget for different kinds of things. You have a budget for addressing um, harmful traditional practices or norms, you know, in society. There's always, the goalpost seems to shift every time there's need to do a project that empowers, you know, women. And another thing I see very strongly is the budget, uh, budgetary allocation. So once it is something that empowers women and empowers children, uh, you are building people to fight us. You don't mm. want people to again and the rest and so the budget automatically is designed to frustrate you out of the idea you know um we won't give up we'll continue keeping at it and we'll continue doing the little we can do as much as possible i keep encouraging people to use the small platforms and keep telling whatever stories they can tell in whatever ways document your realities and the documentation of reality one thing it does for us is it helps to build statistics so in documenting my realities, I've been able to say, oh, so, 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 and so kind of things. People are not interested in investing in this. And then give me an opportunity to say, where else, you know, can we find partnerships? Where else can we find alliances? The men in the industry, it's about time we started telling what he thought as uncommon stories. Because a lot of people are bored with the repetition of mm. things that are churned out daily. And so how about thinking through the lenses of females, through the lenses of other genders? Let me not say females because there's not only females, but, you know, the female gender. How about seeing things through the lenses of other genders? I mean, as simple as a public toilet, who should be in a public toilet? So if an intersex person comes into a public toilet, for instance, you know, where does the person go? Male toilet or female? Mm. These are simple things that happen, and there are over 40 variations of the intersex, you know, of intersex, and there's so many of those people. The first case I saw was years ago, and I still, you know, remember how it came about. I mean, it came to me by way of the person was being bullied, right? Human rights violation. But that's something that, it was an eye-opener for me. The lady put to bed, and during Omugwa, her people found out that the, her, you know, she pretty much. Oh, had... sorry. I I don't know if we have time to tell the story because they're warning me now that we have to, we have to go. Yeah. Okay, so if you can please much... just yeah round it up. So what I was mm -hmm. say was this. At the the bottom line was that everybody was human and everybody has a solution and many people who are pointing fingers are not ready to prepare the you know to act on the needed solutions. But let's provoke mm. think towards the realities of human beings simply because we are human beings let's capture the realities of everybody thank, thank you so much thank you so much Dorothy um Onize um I'll go to you quickly if you can just highlight the points from the legal um perspective what what are the key things a filmmaker needs to know when they're making films an impact film 
you know, I really appreciate what film, I mean, impact filmmakers are doing because from everything, for instance, what Dory have mentioned, you're not really talking about, is not as, um, is, is not as lucrative as the usual um, film productions. You're just doing it because you want these people to heal. You want, you want justice for these women or men, um, you know, whichever one it is. So I want to urge you to keep on doing what you're doing because it's important you do what you're doing because even though we have legislators, you are the voice that we actually believe you're the voice that you know, can speak for us and really um, um, amplify these issues that we have. So um, even though that one is important as um, a lawyer, I would like to always advise that please you have to also back, you know, um you you need a backup legal backup you have to make sure that um you verify your stories first of all if you have identified the goal that you want whatever if it's a docu series or you want real life documentaries especially real life documentaries so that you will not have a situation where you're being sued or the, the, the survival of abuse that is already gone through a lot. Sorry, excuse me. Um, survival of abuse. It is very important that you, we gather evidence, do research on this story, see how you can protect yourself. And then when you, when you have done that, even if there's any case or any situation when somebody, because there's always that tendency that somebody will come out and deny the stories and try to attack the credibility or the integrity of your production company or whatever so it's always good to always have this you know at the back of your mind also empathy is very important you have to even though empathy is important you have to also detach yourself emotionally from, from that story so that you don't find yourself using the, the instigator syndrome trying to instigate like I think it was Dory that mentioned that that you know at times some stories are forced stories are forced on them because they say your story is too serious. So you have to tell the story as it is. You know it's very important to do that. So when you're um, when you're interviewing when you're interviewing that your um, the character that you want to use, you have to make sure that you get the facts right. Apart from getting the facts right, you have to make sure that even though they decide to withdraw while taking this, because I know that your project can be such a passionate thing, but you have to detach yourself. You know where to let go and know that these people, they are human beings at times, you know, it's so overwhelming. So you have to make sure that you let them realize that your project is not the, the priority in this case. It is them healing. It is getting justice for them. So they can speak their truth at their own and their own pace. Mm -hmm. So I think that is very um, that is very important. So I guess because of time, um, yes. Let's see that. <laughs> yes, I know. Because of that, I don't know. I just, I, I, run up? <laughs> I just yes, please. I just want to put you go to my OR so we can wrap okay. up, please. All right, yes. that's all right. Okay. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I wrote down some some things here. Said, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we need to use and keep maximizing our technological innovation. So let's keep maximizing our social media. Let's keep them. Um, if, if we, I can't imagine if we didn't have Twitter. And so those things are free. We need to also learn to work on very low, um, low budgets. Um, YouTube. I've done projects. Yeah, YouTube. I've, I've done projects. I've, I've done stories of some women. And then I just posted it on YouTube. I posted it on all social yeah. media platforms. And then we also need to have more dynamic storytellers, um, like the like the previous speaker said. So, um, don't be too emotional. So let's let's put empathy into what we are into what we're saying. Have more people writing stories that hit the nail, like um, like say it say it as it is, but say it in a way that every other person, including a child, will get it. And so mm. also we also need to have um we need to also say these stories from the point of view of the people who are going through these issues. Let's say it from their point of view. So that you don't go to a place and say, Oh, I think this is the problem. No, 
you need to ask let's begin to ask more questions and then another thing i need filmmakers to also do is that you need to also receive sign content notes so some content letters make sure you keep signing for everything mm -hmm. you do keep signing you, you you don't want any story that oh i didn't i didn't agree to it if if the if the person says this say something and then you know that this can implicate your company in the future sign tell them to sign a document so you don't you don't you don't do something good and eventually comes back to haunt you that's one yeah. of the things that um, and also i also said um we should also we, we need to have more funders who are a little bit more more relaxed with their requirements for grants you know part of the issues that affect filmmakers is, is their inability to get um, okay. funding so we need to also have these funders who would be a little bit and um we know they are patriarchal but then a little bit more so we need to even have more women empowered because when we have more women empowered to have this money we don't need to have patriarchal form of funding women would fund women if we are really into in ourselves if we're going to tell ourselves the truth eventually we need to have more women making this money who can fund more stories and so we can tell our stories by ourselves with our own money and our own resources Thank you. i totally agree i totally agree so yes um Let's just um, one more word from Choma and then we'll wrap up. Any uh, advice for filmmakers, please? Just one minute. One well, minute okay. and we'll wrap up. Minutes. Yeah. Okay, one so minute and we'll wrap up. Since I'm constrained into one minute, I think I would want to um, remind us of something powerful like um, Dr. Sally Hu said in her presentation. Life imitates art, she said. And I, I cannot agree any less. Please, I'd like to see filmmakers um, drive narratives that will begin to drive um, behaviors, that will begin to drive responses and drive um, um, people's um, disposition to issues around gender, particularly around women. So instead of just, I mean, depicting the norm as it were, or depicting our age-long um, practices, practices that are becoming obsolete, can we begin I mean, a lot of sci-fi movies and the rest of them are there. Can't we begin to advance narratives and project them to what we want to see? Can we begin also to um, utilize little spaces in movies that are maybe not otherwise um, gender-driven, but to introduce narratives that will advance the course? We can, I mean, she, she, she made that um, point about having women mechanics and the rest of them. Can we begin to introduce that will, um, in better light, in, in, in current and hopeful trends, so that it is no longer the story of yesterday, but we're now advancing and projecting the story of the future, such that that future, future now begins to mirror the current in a way that people aspire to it and begin to imitate it, and it becomes our new reality. This is me speaking in short. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this panel. And um, we will be in touch. We have each other's emails and um, we hope to do this very, um, very soon again. We'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.